All right, well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Angela Proctor, and I'm with the North Florida Affiliate of Disability Inn. And um, we're just so excited to have you here today with us for this um, learning session about dispelling myths and misconceptions and reducing unconscious bias in hiring people with disabilities. I wanted to tell you just a little bit about disability in North Florida. Uh, we were initiated in 2006 as an affiliate of Disability Inn, and we are a 501c3. And we focus on education and business to business best practice sharing around hiring and creating inclusive workplaces for people with disabilities. And our goal is really to expand across North Florida and increase the impact to improving the employability of people with disabilities. And we have several board members who represent the Federal Reserve Bank, Amazon, Florida Blue, Dynamic Corporate Solutions, and Flagler Health. And we're so excited to continue our 2021 programming with the ABLE Trust. And again, just very, very glad that you've joined us. I'd like to make a special acknowledgement to Allison Chase. She's the interim president of the ABLE Trust and she's running things from behind the scenes. And so thank you so much, Allison. I know you're not on camera um, for your support and partnership. And um, I'd like to go ahead and ask my fellow board member and today's moderator, John Wagner to open the panel and we can go to the next slide. Thank you so much, Ange. And I am very excited today to take this opportunity to introduce everybody to a very, to a very neat group of, of presenters. We're gonna, it's a very auspicious group, as they say, which um, as I understand means that it's a group that's gonna lead us to success. So uh, I'd like to start by introducing uh, Jennifer uh, Sheehy, the, de the Deputy Assistant Secretary. She leads the US Department of Labor Office of Disability Employment Policy. For those of us, uh, we always affectionately refer to it as ODEP. Uh, previously served on the, as, at the US Department of Education as the acting director of National Institute on Disability and Rehabilitation Research uh, and the acting director, deputy commissioner uh, of the Rehabilitation Services Administration. Uh, our, our next uh, panelist will be Dr. J.R. Harding. Uh, Dr. Harding serves as a lecturer for the uh, Department of Management at Florida State University College of Business. I ask that everybody please keep any pro Florida Gator comments to themselves throughout the course of our, our conversation, except for maybe moderators. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Harding uh, really uh, focuses on uh, his academic specialty is on educational leadership with a focus on disability-based subject matter. Uh, he's a two-time U.S. presidential appointee and a seven-time uh, Florida gubernatorial appointee and has contributed uh, nationally, state, and locally uh, to impact uh, community and, and, and um, public policy. So uh, really, uh, uh, really appreciate Dr. Harding's time. Uh, and. The third panelist is Megan Smith, and I've had the opportunity to uh, work with Megan over the years and, and, and think that uh, she is just an absolute uh, blessing uh, to uh, be able to spend so much time with us and helping champion uh, such wonderful causes as it relates to uh, accessibility and uh, employment opportunities and the quality of people with disabilities. So um, Megan works with Amazon. She's the head of people accessibility and she serves as an advisor to the Amazon PWD affinity group, their uh, employee uh, work group. For more than a decade, Megan has influenced customer experience, disability services, accessibility and diversity programs in healthcare, education, employment and technology industries. And I had the opportunity to work with her at least in one of those stops and will tell you that her impact is uh, broad and, and strong. So uh, really, really do appreciate that. She's particularly passionate about leading change in global access to healthcare and employment of people with disabilities and is currently responsible for ensuring an accessible and inclusive candidate 
and employee experience at Amazon. And, and she didn't ask me, but I do want to remind everybody that today is the second day of, of the, uh, the shopping holiday with Amazon. So, uh, so, you know, don't be afraid to multitask a little. Uh, so today we're all here to, to spend a little time talking about how myths and misconceptions and unconscious bias uh, that we all have influences and contributes to employment gap of people with disabilities. Now, depending on whose stats you use and, and what you buy in, and I know our speakers will probably use them, but, but, but we have historically had an employment gap of people with disabilities, uh, even college educated folks or people with disabilities at, at a third to 40% of those without. And, and we know that that's really a, you know, a relate back to this, this concept of unconscious bias. And so I think we're gonna really have an opportunity to dig down deep into this uh, and get some really great insight and input. We're gonna talk about structural and ad attitudinal barriers that exist uh, from our panelists and their own experiences. So um, what I'd like to do if we could is just take a, a minute or two and let's allow each panelist to kind of make a, a brief opening statement as it relates to myths and misconceptions and unconscious bias. And, and, and Jennifer, would you mind starting? I would love to. Thank you so much, John. And I really want to thank uh, Allison Abel Trust. Um, really excited to be among this uh, very well-known and a prestigious group. And I have to give a special shout out to JR, who is a friend of, who, who goes way back. Um, but it's great to meet new friends too. And I, as, as you mentioned, John, I'm with the Office of Disability Employment Policy or ODEP, and I'm glad that you're sharing in that endearment as well. And we are actually celebrating our 20th anniversary this year. So we were created by Congress in 2001 to coordinate the many programs, services, and enforcement agencies that interact to support employment success for people with disabilities. And how we do that is we test, we, we run grants and demonstrations to build evidence for promising practices and strategies. And then we work with our federal colleagues, we work with Congress, we work with White House, in order to promote uh, policies that would scale those practices so that as many people with disabilities as possible can benefit from them. But we also have an arm through which we work with employers because employers are such important customers of ours and we wanna support your workplace and your success as well um, through hiring and uh, retaining people with disabilities and, and their talents. It's critically important that every American who wants to work can work, including those with disabilities. And we want to figure out what your workplace workforce needs are, and then help you meet those by hiring people with disabilities. So that is that's why employers are so important in our work. And I look forward today to talking about how we can best support you all. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, wonderful comments. Uh, JR, uh, opening comment, please. Well, thank you, John. Um, thank you, Abel Trust, Jennifer, Megan, and everybody who is on uh, this webinar. This subject is near and dear to me. I'm here representing the university community, students with disabilities in, in this voice, and uh, I'll try and stay focused in, in, in that arena. I would say, watch out America, watch out world. Persons with disabilities and students with disabilities are coming, they're eager, and they had skills. And in fact, um, one of my uh, recent students graduated and was hired by our colleague's company. And she just moved out to uh, Los Angeles to be a part of that Amazon team. 
I have found that uh, students with disabilities often achieve higher standards than uh, their cohorts without disabilities because they are used to uh, overcoming barriers, problem solving, being innovative, and um, often doing things well in advance because as we all know, life has that way of happening. And thus individuals with disabilities are often a little more prepared for that unknown situation. And so in the world of uh, higher ed, the uh, inclusion piece is very much there. And what I mean by that is 35 years ago, or maybe it was 40 when I entered the higher ed arena, I was the only one of 35,000. I like the Ed Roberts story at Berkeley. Um, and other places across the country, those, those individuals who had the courage to be uh, trailblazers. Well, today, now the higher education population, at least at Florida State, is well past 15%. And so what I mean by that is in every class, in every environment, in every activity, you will find talented young people with disabilities. So I'm very excited to uh, bring this piece uh, of the puzzle to our discussion today. Thank you, John. Thank you so much, Chair. And, and last, but by no means least, Megan, an opening comment, please. Thank you, John. You are giving me quite the ego boost today, so thanks for that. Um, I'll echo the other panelists. Just thank you so much, Abel Trust and Allison, for this partnership with Disability and uh, North Florida Board. Um, I'm so honored to be a part of that board and work with colleagues like John, Ange, and the other board members who are on the call. Um, so thank you all for attending, um, and thank you, um, JR and Jennifer, for joining us today um, for this really important discussion. Um, I'll just open by saying I identify as a person with a disability. I'm what's considered legally blind. Um, and as JR and Jennifer were talking about, you know, their roles in this important kind of ecosystem of disability employment, it just uh, reminded me how important higher education and uh, ODEP and the, the uh, programs through ODEP were in helping me frame how I think about disability employment and the work that I do at Amazon. So um, as a, a person with a disability, an employee, an employer, a manager, uh, just really thrilled to be having this conversation and to talk about some of the ways that we can um, overcome myths and, uh, and potential bias in the employment of people with disabilities. So thanks so much for having me. Oh, th thank you. And, and with those great comments, I'm going to, I think they are a great segue into our, my first question. So, so Megan, given your uh, deep personal and corporate experiences, what are common kind of systematic barriers or systemic barriers uh, that you have seen in the hiring practices throughout the years? Yeah, thank you for that question, John. Um, so in my role at Amazon um, in accessibility and just with, you know, a decade or so of experience doing this, um, what I have seen is that inclusive hiring practices are built on, and there's the dogs barking in the background. Sorry, if you all can hear that, it never fails on any panel that this will happen. So apologies for the background noise. Um, but inclu inclusive hiring practices are built on a foundation of an accessible experience. Um, and for those who aren't familiar, when I say accessible, it means that candidates or even others in the hiring process, like hiring managers or interview participants, can independently navigate the technology and processes to apply, assess, and interviews. In, in interview, that it works with assistive technologies like screen readers, and that there aren't steps in your process that inadvertently screen out candidates or exclude hiring managers or interviewers with disabilities from equitable participation. So it starts with a foundation of accessibility, making sure that the tech and the processes work for everyone. The next area I found opportunities to increase inclusion are in the messaging and signals that companies send about what a successful interview is. So you may see things like maintain eye contact or always have your camera on. And I encourage companies to inspect what these messages, the messages that they're sending for the why. So what skill is really being assessed when you expect a candidate to maintain eye contact, for example? 
And in some cases, there may be valid reasons for those interview norms. But in other cases, we're passing off preferences as a part of what's expected in that company's culture. You'll also see sometimes companies create separate disability inclusive hiring or interview guides, um, best practices for interviewing disabled candidates. And while that's really important uh, information to have for hiring managers, recruiters, and interviewers, it should be the norm, not the thing that we dust off when someone has disclosed in the interview process that they have the disability. It should just be the practices that we use for all candidates. To me, in an ideal state, a candidate doesn't have to disclose their disability to navigate your hiring process, but you've created an inclusive process where it is easy to disclose and request the accommodation if they need one. Sorry, I was taking notes. Uh, so, so Jennifer, ba based on, on uh, what Megan has shared with us, and I, I think it's very insightful, um, as, as you think about those comments, what are some of the best practices that you see from federal contractors and other businesses that they can implement to address these barriers and increase the inclusion of people with disabilities in our workforces? Thanks for the question, John. And um, going back to your comment about unconscious bias, unconscious bias is bias that's natural that um, that almost everyone has in some way, shape, or form, and it's just based on your personal experience. So we don't fault people for having it. What we do is um, help employers or hiring managers or anyone just figure out where they might have it and then how to mitigate against letting unconscious bias uh, shape your decisions. Um, and with people with disabilities, basically what that means is, I'll give you a quick example. Let's say you're a child and you're always looking up, literally looking up to authority figures. Well, that looking up may be a factor in driving who you see as an authority uh, later in life. And this goes to a statistic that less than 15% of men are over six feet tall. However, 60% of corporate CEOs are over six feet tall. So there, there might be a little unconscious bias there, but that could also um, affect how you react to someone in a wheelchair uh, just because they are not as tall as other people in the workplace. So we have something we call the inclusion at work framework. And you can find this on our Employer Assistance and Resource Network on Disability Inclusion, or what we affectionately call EARN. And you can find all these strategies at askearn.org. So for example, uh, the Inclusion at Work framework is a framework that employers can use to build their disability inclusive workplaces. It outlines seven core components of inclusive workplace practices and has a menu of strategies for achieving them. EARN developed it in collaboration with employers, and we use lots of examples uh, from employers, like Megan was just talking about, like Amazon. And uh, full disclosure, we love Megan because she's been part of our work uh, through one of our other initiatives that I'll talk about a little bit later. But we, we take what has been successful, truly successful in the workplace, strategies that employers have used and there's evidence behind. And then we incorporate those into this uh, core component, uh, the seven core components of our inclusion at work framework. So just a, a couple of other, just a couple of those categories, how to communicate, how to ensure productivity with reasonable accommodations, talent acquisition and retention, building the pipeline, outreaching and recruitment, leading the way, 
how to incorporate and build an inclusive business culture, uh, measuring success, be tech savvy. And that involves uh, making sure that all of the systems that you use through technology in the workplace can be accessible. And um, I'll stop there and talk about some of those others later. Thank you. And that's great. And, and I do want to remind everybody that we do have the chat function up and running. And we have posted uh, the, uh, the www.askearn.org. And other key information as we see it, we'll post it up there. But also don't be afraid to make a comment or ask a question. Uh, it would be uh, always appreciated. Um, JR, um, as we expect to see more and more workers identify as people with disabilities, where do you see the impact of unconscious biasness showing up in how people with disabilities experience the hiring process? And then what are some of the practices that individuals and or companies can start to practice, practice to practice to address? Well, I is a mouthful there. It sure is. It, it is an awful lot. First, I'd like to give Jennifer a shout out on her inclusion framework because I, I find that to be a fabulous model and actually use it in class and one of my HR programs to assist hiring managers and others to understand kind of all of us, the points or the reflection pieces that you should look and examine of where can we do things better, whether it's communication, it's leadership, onboarding, training, development, um, even retirement, if you think of the life cycle items of technology and how everybody needs to be able to use it at all ages. And um, some of us have kids or grandkids or the neighbors and you know, I don't know about Jennifer, but I'll pass my phone over to the 19 year old and say, hey, help me out here. And then make that happen in a blink of an eye where it, it might take uh, us uh, a day or two just to, to um, see if it's, what do they call it? Um, keep it simple, right? Is it functional? Is it usable? Um, is, is, is it clear using those universal design principles? And so, I, I say some of that to get back to your point, John. We have thousands, hundreds of thousands of well-qualified, proven individuals coming out of our post-secondary uh, institutions with disabilities. They were able to get in competitively. They were able to competitively uh, uh, complete their curriculum graduate with high marks, many with some uh, work experience coming with them. And now um, we run into the work world, the, the conscious bias or the unconscious bias piece. And I, I take a, a little component like when I roll into the classroom the first day to teach, the eyes, John, Megan, Jennifer, you know firsthand as a quadriplegic in my big mobility device, the wow factor in their eyes of, I haven't seen this before. This is going to be interesting, right? And all kinds of judgments are, are happening. But you know, by the end of the semester or really a week or two later, I'm just the professor. Okay, I'm just the instructor. The chair really becomes insignificant. So to your point, I think really it's education and the experiential um, learning here. The interaction, because what people don't know is what they are afraid of. What they have had no experience with is unknown and therefore I am going to avoid it. That means, you know, the small business owner, the coffee shop owner, right? The mid-sized company. No, not every company has the luxury and the resources and the time to hire a Megan Smith, right? And to build a, a culture around it because the, the big companies 
have the HR, have the attorneys, have the processes. It's those smaller companies because we don't have enough um, Amazons, Walmarts, um, Facebook, um, and, and on and on. If, if you follow where I'm going here, John. So the, the question then becomes really is, how can those who are uninitiated gain a quicker comfort level with those of us who may have a twitch or um, lack some discipline in some of the social settings because of autism or require a fully universally accessible environment or provide those reasonable accommodations that are, are, are needed. So I, I'll, I'll wrap it up there since time is of essence here. Thank you, thank you so much, Dara, for those comments. And kind of based, based on those comments, I'm gonna uh, switch back over to Megan and, and kind of to, to build on a, on a point to ask Megan a question that says, you know, what, what, what do you see as the, are the common myths or bias specifically that recruiters or hiring managers have when hiring people with disabilities? And, and then how, as JR was pointing out, helping people um, become educated and those experiential periods in our lives that help us grow, how, how, do, you, how do you advise um, those recruiters and hiring managers uh, to overcome some of these uh, bias? Yeah, thanks for the question, John. Um, and I, I so appreciate what JR was saying is, you know, that for so many people, um, as a person with a disability, we might be the first time that they've interacted with a person with that disability. Um, and I think some of what feeds the, the bias and the misconceptions around people with disabilities is this, um, this, Exercise, and sorry, the dog is, again, she just can't handle not being the star of the show. Um, but when people think about people with disabilities, they imagine what their life would be like if they had a disability. So they might think, well, what if I couldn't use my legs? What if I couldn't see? What if I couldn't hear? Or I had an anxiety attack once. And while there can be value in linking your own experiences to the experiences of people with disabilities for the sake of empathy, Empathy doesn't mean that you understand the lived experience of people with disabilities and have challenged your biases. And so the like close your eyes and imagine if game um, that people will play around disability is a dangerous one because you imagine all the things that you would not be able to do or how hard it would be to do those things. And in my experience, and, and I think JR was talking about this earlier as well, for the most part, people with disabilities are a resilient bunch. And every day we navigate physical technology and cultural situations that were not designed for us. Um, and if there's something that we can't do, we know what that thing is and we know what accommodations we need to create an equitable experience for ourselves. And so you don't need to imagine as a hiring manager or as a recruiter, how we might do something. Um, we've gotten that taken care of. And if we need anything to be able to do the job that we've applied for, um, we will ask for it. Um, the other thing I've noticed um, is that in the hiring process, people may talk about qualified candidates with disabilities. So they'll be sure to add in qualify, qualified as a qualifier. And they wouldn't necessarily do that with women or with black candidates. You wouldn't say, qualified women for this role or qualified black candidates for this role. But we might do that with people with disabilities because we have this unconscious bias that they might not be qualified. Of course you wouldn't hire someone that isn't qualified. But when you add that word, it's sending a signal that people with disabilities might not be. So that's something that, I, that I've seen in, in hiring practices. And then to quickly address a few other myths, and, and out of the Jennifer shop, and particularly the Job Accommodation Network is really where I'm, I'm stealing these things. And they're things I learned way back when and early on in my career. Um, number one, no employer should lower the job requirements. The job is the job. And it's about what is the path for someone to complete the job. The second thing would be most accommodations are free. And the ones that do cost money, the average cost is $500, unless that number has changed recently. 
And then studies that show, as JR mentioned earlier, that people with disabilities have lower absenteeism and greater tenure than, your, than their peers. And so if you are finding yourself in the position to help a hiring manager or a recruiter kind of overcome some biases that they may have or some misconceptions they may have about candidates with disabilities, going to the Ask Earn website and then also going to the askjan.org website, A-S-K-J-A-N.org website, you can find these really great um, data points that will help bolster the case of actually the accommodations are probably going to be free. I remember at uh, Florida Blue, my accommodations, my main accommodation was meeting an eye hook under my desk so that I could clip the leash of my guide dog <laughs> to my desk. Um, you know, so maybe a 25 cent accommodation um, that really enabled me to be effective um, in that type of workplace. Um, and so it's it's really, again, like not assuming or playing the what if I was game, but just having an open dialogue about disability when a candidate discloses it and trying to understand what are the things that they need to be able to bring their full selves to the job. Thank you. That's very, you know, I think really helps folks kind of get their heads around opportunities they have to help uh, hiring managers and, and kind of start to kind of expand our perspective on, on, on approaching the hiring process. So thank you for that. I'm going to I'm gonna kind of pivot on this same concept a little bit with Jennifer, if that's okay. And, uh, and, and start to add, kind of shape this up in this kind of post COVID world, right? So more and more we're, we're becoming either 100% virtual or somewhere between where we were and 100% virtual. And um, what resources can employers leverage as they seek to ensure access for people with disabilities uh, in this new work environment and this uh, new post-COVID environment. Thank you. And um, I love the chat too, because I was typing a chat answer to one of your participants here. I also love that Megan talks about our resources better than I can. That is awesome. Thank you. Um, so this, this COVID has just wrought so many changes in the, the workforce and with businesses. Um, I'll talk about a couple things. So when businesses had to move to telework for everyone, uh, in some cases, what we heard was that their employees that with disabilities who had telework as an accommodation were able to help them figure out how to transition to telework for everyone. They had some of those hybrid meeting best practices or telework best practices in order to conduct fully virtual meetings. And that was great to hear. The job accommodation network that uh, Megan mentioned also has many tools for successful teleworking um, for everyone. And, and again, those accommodations most 60% of accommodations that Jan helps with uh, cost nothing. And of those that do have a cost, 500 is a very typical uh, cost, one-time cost. There, for small businesses, there are tax incentives, tax credits that they can access if they've made an investment in a more expensive accommodation for someone. Like I use a wheelchair also. If somebody needs to uh, create an accessible bathroom uh, where they didn't have one before and a, a small business, then they can get a credit, a tax credit for doing so. Um, they, I wanna mention also that the telework obviously required remote learning and using technology. Technology has advanced so much since I had my spinal cord injury in 1994. And many, many of the technical features that you use on your computer or your phone uh, now have built-in accessibility features. So you, a, a company doesn't have to 
spend more to create those accessibility features. I think that's great. One of the initiatives that ODEP works on is called the Partnership for Employment and Accessible Technology. And that's the initiative that we've worked with Megan on and, and her company. And uh, through that initiative, we work with developers and employers to ensure that accessibility, accessibility features are incorporated at the front end of technology development so that uh, payroll software is also now accessible to people with disabilities or your learning system, if you have an online learning system, that that can be accessible to people with disabilities. And all of these are practices that will ensure an inclusive recovery as well when we go back to kind of a hybrid environment. Um, many people, sadly, because of COVID, are coming back with new disabilities, um, some, that, some that we call now long COVID. And it's important for a company, um, I know companies wanna do the right thing, to help those employees um, transition back to work and adjust to new accommodations or tools that they need. And again, the Job Accommodation Network can help with those tools. They can also help a company, especially small businesses, navigate the civil rights laws that people with disabilities are covered by, like the ADA or Family Medical Leave Act or the Fair Labor Standards Act in, in some cases. Uh, the Job Accommodation Network has tools and consultants who can help businesses navigate those with uh, their employees that may have new disabilities or, or maybe have a disability that they didn't need accommodation for in an in-person environment that they need an accommodation now that they are in a remote environment. So I encourage people to go to the Job Accommodation Network and see if uh, they can be helpful as well for them. They've done more than a million consultations in the history of JAN, so they're definitely experts and more expert even than I can be. And um, I'll stop there. Thank you for that. That was that was wonderful information. Uh, as you were as you were talking, I was I was thinking about not only the the issues we're seeing with people coming back into the or coming back into the workforce with an, maybe a new onset of of uh, a disability, but even in our future workforces, right? So we're seeing significant spikes in children with mental health issues be, because of. Uh, what's occurred in the, the home-based learning and the, and the way, you know, children develop and, and those type of things. So I think, I think there's really, there's kind of a short phase of opportunities and then to your point, a, a longer pull in the tent that we're going to have to address at some point in time. And I'm going to use that as kind of an opportunity to ask JR, um, and I'm really looking forward to this, this question, is if he could really kind of share with us um, what inclusive practices that he, that he's seen that these future workers that that he gets to interact with and and, and educate and, uh, and and be educated by um, as it relate particularly those with disabilities but not exclusively but what are, who, who are currently in this in this this educational environment what are they seeing and then what are they what do you feel that they'll be expecting from employers to provide to help them as, as they transition into this, into their professional careers. Well, thank you, John um, and Jennifer and Megan for all of the, uh, your spots. My brain is just running with all kinds of wonderful uh, components and Pete, uh, that partnership on employment and technology is just fabulous. To answer John's question, um, again, multi-layer and I don't know how we can get all of this info in at once. But start with what are these students expecting, John? Right? Well, they're expecting to be given clear direction, clear opportunities. They want to perform. 
and they are competitive. They are good at what they know, whether it's you know a, a business major, an education major, a criminology major, a music major. The students are just sharper than they've ever been. They also have an expectation and a sense of a uh, social community values of um, giving back the amount of time uh, they, they care for our, our fellow neighbors and, and they want to be able to find a space that sets high goals. Disability isn't an excuse. A disability is really an asset and, and they want to find places that value and reinforce giving back to the community. I, I, they, they don't want to be associated with, you know, organizations with blinders on, people who don't appreciate that it kind of takes the village perspective. Now, I have found these students to be, you know, um, really the, the, the 22nd century kind of visionaries when it comes to technology, the use of it, the multitasking, the uh, ability to work and contribute anywhere, anytime. And I think whether it's a 10 o'clock assignment coming in, so it's ready for Megan to um, turn on her email at eight in the morning and it's there waiting for her, well, then that's a satisfactory expectation. It's tell me what you want, tell me when you want it, and get out of my way and allow me to do it, right? If I need certain tools, I think the expectation is Megan and Jennifer was saying, tell me what accommodations you need. I expect the person to be that expert within their own identity and needs. And finally, I'm gonna end this with most students with disabilities, not all, most have actually excelled in this COVID technology arena, and especially those in the uh, neurodiversity arena, where it allowed them to focus just on the assignment, the time, the execution, or the product, rather than all the distractions you might find, let's say, on Landis Green or out there or near the football stadium or whatever else might be because those uh, distractions may make it difficult for someone with ADHD or learning disability, or even for that matter, a mobility impairment, just trying to navigate around the world itself. So this technology and distance learning and distance business and, and, and distance emotional support has worked well with this uh, generation and they are going to expect to retain some elements of it as we move forward. And so if I was um, being hired by Megan, I would hope that you know, 20 or 30% of my time would enable that flexibility of anytime, anywhere, and it's about the product. Thank you, great, great comments. And, and I will share that I don't know that I could ever um, perform high enough to work for Megan. So I'm, I'm gonna try to personally avoid that, but uh, I feel like at some point in time, we all may be. Um, so as, as we, and we're doing pretty good on time. So um, I'm gonna, I have one question for Megan and then we'll probably spend a few minutes just getting some closing thoughts. But so a, a, as we kind of close out the, the Q and A part of this, um, can you share any insights you have as a hiring manager with a disability who hires diverse teams of people, including people with disabilities and, and just, you know, kind of your perspective? We, we'd love to, love to be able to hear that. Yeah, I'm happy to share and I'd be happy to hire you anytime, John, to work with me, not for me. Um, so I'm really fortunate that my awesome team um, that is people accessibility uh, includes both people with and without disabilities. And we identify across a wide spectrum of other diversity dimensions. 
Um, one of the greatest things that Amazon does that has helped me build such a diverse team is that we truly set candidates up for success. Um, we have a robust applicant and, a can applicant and candidate accommodation programs, and then our recruiters spend time prepping every candidate on what to expect in the interview process. So they'll talk about format of the interview, the types of questions and the types of responses we expect to receive. They'll talk about common pitfalls. Um, they really go in detail to prepare a candidate for what's going to happen in that phone screen or in that day of interviews. Because we want our candidates to have all of the information that they need to shine. We don't play the gotcha game. Um, and I try to carry that forward into my interviews. So I model that same behavior. I let them know the format that I'm gonna use. I ask them if they have any clarifying questions or if there's any more information that they need from me to be able to answer questions fully that I ask them. Um, sometimes I'll disclose my disability or I'll mention a tidbit of information about diversity at Amazon to demonstrate that we truly are inclusive here. Um, and then I've had candidates with disabilities who point blank ask me, what is it like to have a dis disability at Amazon? And I don't give them a stock corporate answer. I talk to them about my experiences as a person with a disability, which happen to be positive, um, and how I've become a part of this community of people with disabilities at Amazon who help me navigate when there is a challenge. Um, some companies may be afraid to have this kind of candid conversation about disabilities, especially if you're early on in your maturity for disability inclusion. But one of my favorite things about Amazon is that we have this constant and evolving conversation about disability inclusion. We talk about what works so that we can scale it across the organization. And we talk about what isn't working so that we can dive deep and resolve it. And I think it's this level of candid conversation, this level of intention in making sure that people have all the information that they need to fully perform is what promotes the diversity that we see um, in our teams and for me specifically on my team. Um, another thing I'll add is just uh, interviews uh, in general, I think can be a bit of a you know nerve producing experience, um, whether that's for the interviewer or the interviewee. And in some cases you have a disability on one side or both sides. Um, and so just kind of acknowledging that they're, you know, hey, you know, I know that this is you know, um, probably a nervous situation for you, but let's just have a conversation, right? So trying to take the, the additional stress and anxiety of the process off of the process so that you can truly evaluate that candidate at their best. Um, so those are some of the things that, that have helped me build a diverse team at Amazon. Thank you, thank, thank you so much. And uh, I know that everybody's gonna value everybody's insights. You know, as I was listening to folks, I was jotting down some, some, some points and, or some phrases, you know, that just kind of helped my juices flow a little bit. You know, foundation of accessibility, accessible experience via assistive technology and inclusive practices, inclusion at work framework, ask, earn.org, askjan.org, education and experiential exposure, social viability. Uh, one of my, my favorite phrases here is a uh, 22nd century visionaries with tech <clears throat> and then constant and candid conversations. And, 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 and I, th I think that all of those are, are fabulous ingredients as we continue to kind of bake this cake of a more inclusive environment, a work environment for people with disabilities. And so we, we're coming real close to our time, but I just kind of wanted to open it up and give um, each of our panelists just a, you know, a minute uh, uh, kind of in, uh, as kind of part of our wrap up, if you guys would be open to that. And Jennifer, if I could put you on the spot to start. Sure, and John, you're an awesome moderator and summarizer. I love that list that you just, uh, you just uh, articulated there. That's great. I think I'll use my minute to um, thank everyone, but also um, thank you for bringing up mental health because that it, it is uh, critical right now that we are um, supporting each other in their mental wellness and acknowledging and um, making sure that people with new mental health conditions are getting support. Uh, we do have a mental health toolkit 
for employers so that they can see four easy strategies to incorporate to support their employees who may be facing mental health uh, conditions and, and challenges during COVID or any time. Uh, so thank you again. And I hope uh, your businesses that are engaged with you at Disability and, and Able Trust will reach out to us if they need further assistance. Thank you. Thank you. JR? All right. Thank you, John. And, and thanks to everyone. As we're wrapping up, I'd like to remind the audience and our employers that persons with disabilities, that's the one equal opportunity identity, right? You can be a female and a blind and also hearing impaired. Or likewise, you could be a wheelchair user, an African-American and an um, and, uh, amputee. You know, our stories, our shapes, our colors, our likes, right? Our preferences, our sexuality. We run that whole gamut, right? We really, being able to build a business that is inclusive, that does not have those architectural communication kinds of uh, barriers, because we all want to go through the front door. We all want to go in uh, together. We'd all like to be able to go to the football game, right? It's, it's about inclusivity. And those of us, the 1 billion of us worldwide know immediately when we're walking up to any business or whatever language we're hearing as, you know, Megan as a leader and stuff, that people's first language, do you have the sensitivity? Have you been introduced? And really, then that's a reflection of who the company is and what is that leadership. So thank you very much, John. Thank you. Thank you for those, those wonderful comments. And I think people are going to take a lot away from that. And, and Megan, last Thanks. but not least. Thanks, John. Um, I would have two points and hopefully I can remember them both. The first uh, builds upon what JR was saying, which is um, that diversity includes disability. So I feel like we do all of these things as a company around diversity and inclusion, and then we do some stuff around disability. And we are intersectional um, and we can be what you identify with at any given point in time. Um, and so really including disability intentionally in your diversity efforts um, and in your technology efforts and, and, and um, helps to make sure that you're really looking around corners on behalf of your potential workforce. The second thing I would say, I can't remember. Um, hope, oh, I remember. Um, the second thing I would say is um, whether you're a small business or a large business, you likely already have people with disabilities who are working for you, whether you know it or not. Um, so the more you're creating that kind of open and inclusive workforce, the more likely you are to hear from those employees um, who will have ideas about ways that you can be more inclusive. And I think sometimes employers might be even nervous to hire their first kind of known person with a disability, right? Their first out person with a disability. And, and I would just encourage you to take that first step with them um, and be open and honest about where you are in your journey. And and partner with them to work together to create a more accessible and inclusive place. You don't have to wait until you've got it all figured out. We are used to navigating complex and accessible environments and we will help you do it. Um, so don't wait till you've got it perfect. Go ahead and take that first step, find candidates and employees with disabilities and hire them. So th that is fabulous advice. I, I love the expression, don't let great get in the way of good, right? And so uh, allow, you know, take that first step and, and bring your team along with you. So um, really enjoyed the discussion of this group. I, uh, I think we'd be hard pressed to, to pull together a, a group that would equal this again, um, although we will try. And I'm gonna turn it over to Ange and she's gonna share with you a little bit about um, our future plans and in, in, in our, in our organization. Thank you so much, John. And thank you again to Megan, JR, and Jennifer. Okay, 
Well, we are, there we go. All right. So I wanted to just put a plug in for the Disability In Global Conference and Expo, which is coming up in a couple of weeks, July 12th through 15th. And um, it's an absolutely amazing conference. It's usually held right here in our home state. Um, but this year for the second year, it is gonna be virtual. And if you're interested um, in attending, uh, the link is there. It's really easy. Just go out and look for Disability In and you'll get to the website and, and find the 2021 conference. So just wanted to uh, make sure everyone was aware of that. And then um, Allison, if we can just move on to our last slide there. Um, I just wanted to uh, introduce you all to our board members there. Um, Tara, Megan, Chris, another, another Megan, who we call Meg and John. And uh, we really invite everyone to connect with us on the topic of disability inclusion. We, we learn together, we share best practices of, as we've done today. And um, feel free to reach out to any of us. We're interested in engaging more companies and we're open to new ideas and board involvement. And then coming up at the end of September, we have Kathleen Lee, um, who's going to be joining us from Cornell University, and she's going to be talking about self-identification. And we're actually hoping that some of you might like to join in person. Um, there's a question on our follow-up survey about that. By that time, we may be able to offer some in-person um, gathering. And, um, you know, we'll, we, of course, will still offer video as well and have, have it as a hybrid, um, but we'd love to interact with you and because that's what Disability In is all about. It's the networking, it's the connecting um, among colleagues and um, sharing best practices. So thank you so much for being with us today. And um, I hope to see you again in September. Thank you.